So I didn't get the after lunch slot this time, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, everyone looks pretty awake. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Uh, so I'm talking today about Angular Dart. Uh, how many people here know what Angular Dart is? Okay, that's actually pretty good. That's better than Google. Uh, <laughs> how many of you have used Angular Dart at least like once? Also pretty good. How many of you have used Angular Dart and Flutter in the last six months? All right, it was pretty good, pretty good. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about Angular Dart, a little bit of what it is, uh, why you work on it, and what we're working on next. Um, so let's get started. All right, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Matan, I'm a front-end software engineer at Google. Uh, I actually do interviews for front-end software engineers at Google, so if you do ever, ever apply, you might get me. Uh, I worked at Google for about four years. Uh, before working on Angular Dart, I actually worked on one of the first Angular Dart projects ever at Google, Green Tea, the Google CRM internally. And then from there, I went to go work on widgets for Green Tea written in Angular Dart and Dart. And then I joined the Dart team and I work on Angular Dart. And I think the logical progression at this point is to probably work on C++ or something used to write Dart. Um, you don't want me to do that. And if you haven't seen our repository on GitHub, uh, this is dartlang slash angular. All of our code is here, all of it's open source. We push pretty frequently. Andrew's probably pushing right now. Uh, we have all of our sub packages, the test, the compiler, the, the template parser, the, the router, everything here. It's all managed in one repository. We found that like monorepo, like Kevin said, just works a lot better uh, for our type of package. So it's all right there. And a little bit, even though most of you know what it is, what is Angular Dart and why we find this so important. So here's some examples of Angular Dart. These are the most like easy examples. Uh, if you don't know what this, can't see what this is, this is AdSense and AdWords. Uh, both of these UIs are built in, almost entirely in Angular Dart. These are like giant applications uh, built internally with hundreds of engineers uh, with the Angular Dart team and the Dart team helping. Um, these are probably our flagship applications, so to speak. But it's not just AdSense and uh, AdWords, I mean, we talk about them a lot. Um, for one example, here is AdMob. Um, who here used AdMob? Okay, at least one person. Uh, AdMob's another uh, ad product by Google. Uh, one thing I liked a lot about the AdMob product is that they launched at I.O. this year with a brand new redesign written in Angular Dart. And I think most people on the Angular Dart team didn't know they were using Angular Dart. I mean, they adopted it and migrated everything over, got it running in production super fast, super easily. And that's kind of what we want everyone to feel when they're using our product. So we were like super excited to see someone uh, get that kind of progress. So what is Angular Dart? Uh, I can kind of tell you what our goal is. We want you to be able to build better web apps uh, more easily and obviously in Dart, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is have a productive foundation for, for web apps, uh, have an incremental fast compiler and dev cycle, and of course you want you to be able to write Dart, so idiomatic Dart API and not have to go back and forth too much with JavaScript if you don't have to. So here's an example of what I mean by productive, and I'm sure someone in the back is gonna notice my ligature font for the equals and kind of ask me what that is, so let's ignore that for now. Um, basically, we want to be able to write pretty much HTML or, or HTML-like templates and have that express your most complex views. Uh, I personally love the Flutter style also of writing all of your code in Dart, but some web developers do find it easier, especially when they wrote HTML traditionally, to write an HTML-like syntax when they're expressing their views. They can reuse things like spans and unordered lists, for example, which don't make sense in Flutter, obviously, but would make sense in a web context. So we try to give you a lot of tools to build uh, views and templates around your existing HTML, use existing HTML and CSS knowledge uh, where possible. Of course, incremental is a big part of it. So one of the things we actually measure and track a lot is how quickly you can change your Dart code, have it compile to JavaScript, load the JavaScript in your browser, see the changes, and also be able to debug. And this is an area where in the past, I think we were not doing a really great job. I think we're doing a lot better now. Uh, but incremental is a big part of it. And in a little bit, I'm gonna show you how much work we put into this in the last, really last six months to a year. 
And then the last part's obviously idiomatic. It wouldn't be Dart if you were writing another language. So when we're using like the test framework, for example, we want it to look and feel like Dart, like Dart you'd write normally on the server or for Flutter or just for command light scripts. Nothing too you know, cr crazy or out there. In this particular case, like being able to test that something on the, on the page says, hello, Angular, uh, more or less reads like normal Dart code. With some Angularisms, of course. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works, because I think it's actually really important in understanding why Angular Dart versus doing you know, vanilla Dart or vanilla JavaScript. So everything can kind of be summed up by this slide. I can go through line by line if you want, but that's not too exciting. Basically, we're trying to let you write as little Dart code as possible and kind of express your intent declaratively. So you have a declarative template like I showed before, and you might have some metadata. We use heavy use of metadata, in this case, the annotation at component. And we want to translate that into approximately the equivalent code you'd have to write if you were to write your code by hand. So on the right-hand side is a real but a little bit cut-down example of how we would compile this template into Dart code. Um, it doesn't look that interesting, but sometimes it's actually important to have things in certain order for the compiler to be able to emit better code or to be able to make things more readable. Um, in this case, we're building a little, you know, hello name, and we're going to detect changes of name changes. And that's a big part of Angular Dart. So uh, we want to be able to express that in like very simple code that the compiler can optimize. And Angular Dart's compiler is really the big thing, difference between this and, let's say, Flutter. Flutter actually runs all of your Dart code almost as is in the, in the VM. We actually run your Dart code and then generate Dart code from your HTML and then run those together uh, in the JavaScript VM. So we're generating boilerplate code for your templates. We're uh, generating bindings for change detection so we can tell if things changed. And we're also trying to um, generate efficient dependency injection. Dependency injection is something that Angular Dart and Angular for a long time has put a lot of focus in. And one reason that a lot of Googlers, for example, really like Angular Dart because they grew up with Juice or Dagger or Inject or probably other things I haven't used. So a little bit about what is new and why this applies. This was called What's New with Angular Dart, not Angular Dart 101. So I'm going to go into the little more exciting parts. One big issue people told us is that unlike, say, writing pure Dart code, they weren't getting a really good job of early detection of template errors. They would misspell directives. They would write divs without closing tags. And obviously, the browser kind of just trucks through, and sometimes the compiler did too. And they really wanted to know that they were doing early errors and they were seeing problems in their template. So we took that feedback, and we actually did work on an analyzer plugin. So if you're using IntelliJ or Visual Studio Code today uh, with a little bit of hackery, uh, you can actually get your templates and your HTML analyzed the same way your Dart code be analyzed, and we'll show you errors and stuff just like you would if you're writing Dart code. So here's a blown up example. Um, don't worry, the plugin does not make your font that big. I want you to be able to read it. But in this case, you can see some red squigglies. You can see some problems in the bottom. This is all brand new. This is basically us understanding your intent with the Angular template code and identifying problems. And a lot of, of subtle ones, see if, see if you can see some right here, disabled is spelled wrong. Uh, you have some wrong types, you have some invalid syntax, you have uh, missing quotes. These things really do add up, and these things really do cause production problems, so we want to highlight them as fast as possible. Okay, so well, this is where I admit, just like Slav and everybody else, some of our patterns, some things that we were giving customers to use were just not that dark idiomatic, and were kind of slow. And yes, nails aren't, aren't really that bad, but we wanted to identify them, we wanted to know what they were, and we wanted to see if we could improve them if possible. So here's a really simple example. Uh, in Angular Dart, you can query for child components. You can say, like, oh, I have three buttons, and I want to get a handle to these buttons so I can change them. Uh, the way it was implemented before I started the team, uh, it wasn't really great for performance, and it was kind of hidden. Basically, it created a custom iterable class. Like it actually implemented the iterable interface itself with handwritten code. Uh, it discarded all your type information. So if you were trying to use strong mode and you expected something to be a list of foo, it was always list of dynamic. So you couldn't rely on that. And also you had this weird thing where even though it was an iterable, it had a stream called changes and you had to listen to see if the iterable changed. Like that's just not a pattern you really see in Dart anywhere. Uh, and people were confused and it didn't work really well. So we were trying to think how could we take the same pattern people want to use, find child components, and make it more Darty. 
This is one, here we go. So in this case, this is almost exactly equivalent. See if you can even see the difference in the two code. Uh, on the left-hand side is the old, and the right-hand side is the, the new. Uh, in this particular case, I'm gonna highlight it. All we're doing is we're changing from this weird query list concept, which actually wasn't a list, into a plain old Dart list. And this seems like super subtle and like very simple, but what this does is a lot of things. It actually lets us, first of all, use the, use the built-in array type in JavaScript, which is gonna be faster than some layered custom iterable implementation. It lets us have real type information, so strong mode and other compilers can actually know I have a list of child comp and not a list of anything. Um, and this is the kind of small changes, incremental changes we wanna make to be able to make the compiler obviously uh, a lot better. And, but also make your Dart code feel more like Flutter code or feel more like command line code and not be like very Angular specific all the time. Here's a big one. Uh, I'm sure the right guys will come talk about this and, and they, they filed a couple bugs and I see some of them smiling, so that's good. Uh, here's the part where I admit that dynamic code isn't tree shakeable. Um, how many people know what tree shaking is or have heard the, the word tree shaking before? Okay, that's used pretty much at every Dart conference. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Uh, some people call it dead code elimination. That might even be the better word in some cases. But basically it's the act of trying to figure out code that you're not gonna use and getting rid of it. Um, and even though Angular Dart's a lot better than previous versions, you can still pretty easily write code that will never be used, but we bring it into your final binary. So we wanted to see if we could use the existing code you have as is almost and give you a way to be able to uh, have it be more tree shakeable. So we're experimenting right now with something that lets you, that lets you start your application, but kind of discards a lot of metadata that's not actually used in the runtime of most applications and gets you better uh, code size and performance. I can give you a really simple example. Uh, today, if you write code like on the left, you basically write some classes, put some annotations on them, to most people, they don't think that actually has a cost. Unfortunately, it actually does. It generates code like you see on the right. Uh, basically, it tries to create this like big hash map of every single possible type and factory functions about how to create them. And even if you actually never use this code, it's not written in such a way where the compiler can tell it's never used. Um, when the new, we're, we're trying out the new bootstrap factory function, we actually discard this entire function and most applications run almost entirely as is. So, when applying this, for example, to the Gwit mail sample app, one of Kevin's favorite apps, this is a little sample of the uh, Google, Google Web Toolkit sample app that we co converted to Angular Dart. We took this as is, literally no changes, and just used the new experimental bootstrap, and it got 52% smaller. And like, that's a real number. Uh, we're hoping to see those same kind of things. Thank you. And the goal here, again, is like incremental. We don't want people to have to rewrite their app every time we find out there's a bug in the, in the compiler. So we're trying to do things like this that give you big wins, but don't make you change much or any of your application. Yay. Uh, okay, here's another big one. Dependency injection, I talked about it a second ago. Uh, I'll admit now also, it's not really tree shakeable because the whole concept behind dependency injection is you might get get things at runtime, and we have to provide them for you, but if they're missing, we'll throw, but that's not enough information for the compiler to be able to remove everything. So we wanted to be able to give people a way also to be able to generate dependency injection or service locators at compile time, not runtime, and get a little bit better of code. So we actually added an annotation called injector.generate, which lets you generate injectors at compile time instead of runtime, and I'll show you an example. in recent alpha pre-releases, I have to put asterisks everywhere. Um, if you don't know what dependency injection is, it's pretty simple. It's basically having your code's dependencies given to your code instead of having them hard-coded. So I'll show you an example here. Uh, let's say you have a component tree, and I stole this from Ted Slice, he's gonna notice them, uh, and it provides something called a foo service at the top. And at the bottom somewhere, it injects a foo service. We basically, as Angular, have to provide this hierarchically across your entire application. Even if something does not use foo, we have to provide it because something might use it eventually. Um, and here's where we took, a, again, the same pattern. The top is the code you'd write before, which creates an injector that provides a credit card processor and an HTTP service and some other values. And you pretty much almost copy it as is to the bottom, and you get this compiled ahead of time 
This is a little bit more efficient. It lets you strip out more code. And uh, we're hoping to move more towards this pattern in the future. This is my favorite. Uh, basically, and this is something I'll admit, and everyone's gonna smile because it's true. Uh, we found out that incremental builds were really slow. They were not cached. They were entirely done in memory. If you wanted to debug something, good luck. Uh, also, when people complained to us, we were like, what are you talking about? Everything works great inside Google. Because we have a whole different build system and everything works differently. So we were not having the same experience our users were having. And we also, at the same time, were getting a lot of issues saying, oh, I want to use a JSON serializer in Flutter even. I wanted to use this build package. I wanted to use this generator. So we wanted to have like an all-in-one solution that would give us the same fidelity of builds that Google uses internally, but in Dart and reusable kind of where you would use code generation today. So we wrote a new build system. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is. Uh, it's called Package Build Runner. I know it's the greatest name ever created. Uh, we, we are accepting new names. If you, can, if you can tell me a name you want to use instead, maybe I can convince Kevin to rename the package. Uh, so it's called Build Runner. And the reason for Build Runner is very intentional. First of all, that's what it does. Uh, and second of all, we actually have a whole ecosystem of packages built around this build concept. So if you implement code generators that implement the build package, the constraints there, it actually can work out of the box in many different scenarios. So we have a Bazel implementation of this. We have a build runner implementation. We actually have an old implementation for pub and barback transformers. So it can help you migrate your code. It can help you use your code in multiple places. All right, so I'm gonna explain this now. I'm gonna try my best. Uh, who here uses the Dart Dev compiler today? Not as many as I hoped. Uh, one great thing about the Dart Dev compiler is it lets you build JavaScript incrementally from your Dart sources. So Dart to JS would get this huge blob of uh, Dart. It would have to generate a big blob of JavaScript, hopefully a smaller blob of JavaScript. Uh, Dart Dev compiler has different constraints. It actually wants to build small amounts of JavaScript per Dart file, more of a transpile, more something you, like you would see in TypeScript or you would see in CoffeeScript or I'm sure Elm or Reason or whatever's cool this week. Um, and we tried to emulate that and we did a pretty good job internally because we have different build tools. Uh, in this case, when we compile with Dart Dev Compiler, uh, we get to generate one DDC file for every source file, every Dart file. And you can see the arrows start pointing more and more on the left because actually to build DDCC, you have to know what the result of, well, you don't need to know what source A is, source B, and source C. This could spiral out of control as you have like a really big application. And even here, compiles took longer and longer. And even when they were fast, as soon as you restarted your computer or restarted Travis, everything would have to start over all over again, um, even in a huge graph. Okay, it gets more complicated. Uh, we also wrote a compiler for Angular Dart. So not only do you have to depend on the Dart files, you have to depend on something on the Angular outputs of those Dart files. And again, now you see even more and more arrows. We went from this to this. And again, imagine this like 50 times wider and 50 times deeper. Uh, this is kind of explaining the right situation or anything else like why builds are taking so long. This really can get out of control and the build system had no way to do anything about it. We couldn't even cache because there was no guarantee everything would be uh, built in the same order. Oops. So normally what I did, uh, at least locally, is I would run pub serve and then wait, say, 30 seconds. And the one thing I liked about that a lot is uh, I got to go make a cup of coffee and really you could sit there with the espresso machine and probably do the whole thing and come back and sometimes it wasn't done. Uh, or my favorite, you could go on our programming on Reddit and then you spend, spend a lot of time there. And then hopefully by the time you're done with all 11 articles, the build's completed without an error. And that's not what we wanted. That obviously our second goal was incremental fast compilation, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna show you today a not live stream, because I'm too scared to do that, but a uh, emulated live stream terminal of what it looks like. This is really copied and pasted from my laptop yesterday with everything at head, no special flags I'm hiding or anything, just on a live demo. So this is the first build, all right? So I clone my Angular repository to disk, and I'm gonna go into it. And instead of writing pub serve or pub build, uh, I'm gonna run something called build runner build. And again, names are in progress but I'm gonna do a build of my application. And I'm gonna wait a tiny bit, and this is gonna come up, and it's gonna say that it generated a build script, what is that? It's gonna say it generated an acid graph, what is that? That took some milliseconds. And I wait a little bit more, 
It says build running, that's good. And then finally, after we're done, it took about 33 seconds, 30, almost 34 seconds, with 2,258 outputs. Well, again, whatever that means. Uh, so not too bad, it took 30 seconds. I'm still making cups of coffee or browsing Reddit. That's not too impressive, that's not what I wanted. So why do I care about Build Runner then? Why was that exciting? Really, there's three parts here. Uh, one, it's automatically configured. So just like transformers, you don't have to do much as an end user. If you use a package that requires code generation, it just works out of the box with a little bit of configuration on their part, not yours. Um, you can build, you can serve, and one of the brand new things you can do is you can actually just watch. If you don't want to serve and you just want to output to a directory somewhere, you can totally do that. And it works with Angular Dart today and the alpha pre-release that we have available. So what does this do? It's almost the exact same graph as before, but with this nice little green box, which I like a lot. And again, this is me simplifying a little bit. But basically, for every library or every source file, we can actually cache the result on disk and know that that cannot possibly change and let that whole thing, whole part of the graph or lots of part of the graphs uh, stay cached persistent on disk. Imagine you have a package or 10 packages and you're only modifying one, the other nine packages stay cached on disk forever until you update Dart or update Angular Dart, do something like really big that requires a invalidation. So now I'm gonna show you Build Runner after the first build, which is the actually impressive part. So this is what you see afterwards. Uh, unlike pub server, pub build, you do have a on disk build folder. You can actually see the generated files on disk. If you want to click into them and see what, what happened, why something failed, why something is big or not, you do have the real Dart files on disk. You have the real DDC JavaScript files on disk. You can really inspect everything right in your IDE. And then let's do this one more time. That's not the animation I wanted. All right. Uh, as you can see here, it does run the same build graph. It takes some time, but this time it took 2.4 seconds instead of 30 seconds. That's a pretty big deal. That's from 30 seconds to two seconds. So that's kind of the fidelity we're looking for. And I know that that's not perfect, not, but that two seconds is the difference between going to get a cup of coffee and just refreshing your browser tab and blinking a few times. So we're going for that blinking a few times uh, motif. And the really exciting part, which I find exciting, maybe others don't, is if you have no changes, it takes under a second. So this might not sound like a lot, but let's say for imagine that you have a Travis instance or a Circle CI instance running your, your continuous integration, and you change some change log or some comment somewhere that does not have any impact on your application, your Travis will be able to build in under a second. So this is actually a huge deal. This encourages you to make frequent updates to your repo, not these big giant updates. And this is also the difference, difference between like going, you know, going to for a walk before your CI is done and just like working on your next task, branching and working more. So pretty good. One more thing. Uh, you can cache it on uh, Travis. So this is an example for Travis. Just like your pub cache folder, you can cache your Dart tool folder. That has all these generated files and the acid graph and all this information we need to not reproduce information to make your builds fast. And I'm pretty sure it works for other stuff too. Okay, but what about server watch? I don't want to just build things over and over again. Okay, that's fair. It's the same thing. So instead of doing build runner build, you can do build runner watch or build runner serve. Watch will actually add file watchers. And the nice thing about this is it starts up a Dart VM and keeps it hot in memory. So as the VM and the JIT gets warm, it stays open. And this, this is the same build that took 2.4 seconds before. Now it's taking 200 milliseconds. So this is the kind of build that we actually do expect for small changes. You keep this thing running, you make changes, you refresh your browser, and it should all happen in under a second. Okay, so what is next? I have a few minutes still. If you're looking for the 2018 roadmap, uh, we don't have one yet. It's a uh, work in progress, but I'm gonna tell you, I'll talk a little bit about what we wanna do when identifying the 2018 roadmap. So the number one thing that's important to us right now is releasing a 5.0 beta whenever the SDK 2.0 beta gets released. And that might sound like me kind of hand-waving, but the reality here is that there might be small tweaks to the type system, small tweaks to core libraries, and we don't want to give you a stable product and then say a week later we need to have 6.0 breaking release. So we're going to stay in this kind of alpha level until the SDK gets almost completed, and then we're going to release a beta and kind of go from there. 
uh, there's only three things we're targeting. One is we're tar targeting smaller code for st faster startup. We want less JavaScript to be emitted just for the simplest apps and complex apps. Uh, we're adding a new template parser almost from scratch that gives you a lot better errors. It's actually the same one used by the analyzer plugin that I showed you in, uh, earlier with the IDE. And we want to give you more features to do little performance tunes yourself. So one big request from people is that, okay, we can write really complex apps, but when we hit performance problems, we don't know what to do. We want to kind of give some common solutions to some common problems, like the injector issue, uh, so you can tweak your app. And once we do all that, we'll actually find the uh, mythical 5.0 final release and be on our way. Okay, so thanks. Uh, that's everything. Uh, if you want to see these, this, the code I referenced today or anything, you can go on github.com slash matanluri, twitter.com slash matanluri, or you can email me at matanl at google.com. Thank you. Thank you.